Thus we see our Saviour not only confirmed the moral law, and clearing it from the corrupt glosses of the scribes and Pharisees, showed the strictness as well as obligation of its injunctions, but moreover, upon occasion, requires the obedience of his disciples to several of the commands he afresh lays upon them, with the enforcement of unspeakable rewards and punishments in another world, according to their obedience or disobedience. There is not, I think, any of the duties of morality, which he has not, somewhere or other, by himself and his apostles, inculcated over and over again to his followers in express terms. And is it for nothing that he is so instant with them to bring forth fruit? Does he, their king, command? and is it an indifferent thing, or will their happiness or misery not at all depend upon it, whether they obey or no? They were required to believe him to be the Messiah, which faith is of grace promised to be reckoned to them, for the completing of their righteousness, wherein it was defective, but righteousness, or obedience to the law of God, was their great business, which, if they could have attained by their own performances, there would have been no need of this gracious allowance in reward of their faith, but eternal life, after the resurrection, had been their due by a former covenant, even that of works. The rule whereof was never abolished, though the rigor was abated. The duties enjoined in it were duties still. Their obligations had never ceased, nor a willful neglect of them was ever dispensed with. But their past transgressions were pardoned, to those who received Jesus, the promised Messiah, for their King and their future slips covered, if renouncing their former iniquities, they entered into his kingdom, and continued his subjects with a steady resolution and endeavor to obey his laws. This righteousness therefore, a complete obedience, and freedom from sin, are still sincerely to be endeavored after. And it is no, where promised, that those who persist in a willful disobedience to his laws, shall be received into the eternal bliss of his kingdom how much soever they believe in him, a sincere obedience, how can any one doubt to be, or scruple to call, a condition of the new covenant, as well as faith, whoever reads our Saviour's sermon in the mount, to omit all the rest, can anything be more expressed than these words of our Lord? Matthew 6. 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And John 13. 17, If ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. This is so an indispensable a condition of the new covenant, that believing without it, will not do, nor be accepted, if our Saviour knew the terms on which he would admit men into life. Why call ye me, Lord, Lord, says he? Luke 6. 46, And do not the things which I say? It is not enough to believe him to be the Messiah, the Lord, without obeying him. For that these he speaks to hear, were believers, is evident from the parallel place, Matthew 7. 21-23, where it is thus recorded, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. No rebels, or refractory disobedient, shall be admitted there, though they have so far believed in Jesus, as to be able to do miracles in his name, as is plain out of the following words, many will say to me in that day, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. This part of the new covenant. The apostles also, in their preaching the gospel of the Messiah, ordinarily joined with the doctrine of faith. Saint Peter, in his first sermon, Acts 2. When they were pricked in heart, and asked, What shall we do? Says, verse 38, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The same he says to them again in his next speech, Acts 4. 26, Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. 
How was this done? In turning away everyone from your iniquities. The same doctrine they preach to the high priest and rulers, Acts 5. 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew, and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand, to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel, and forgiveness of sins, and we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Acts 17. 30. St. Paul tells the Athenians, that now under the gospel, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 20. 21. St. Paul, in his last conference with the elders of Ephesus, professes to have taught them the whole doctrine necessary to salvation, I have, says he, kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, and then gives an account what his preaching had been, viz, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus the Messiah. This was the sum and substance of the gospel which St. Paul preached, and was all that he knew necessary to salvation, viz, repentance, and believing Jesus to be the Messiah, and so takes his last farewell of them, whom he shall never see again, verse 32, in these words, And now, brethren, I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up, and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. There is an inheritance conveyed by the word and covenant of grace, but it is only to those who are sanctified. Acts 24. 24, when Felix sent for Paul, that he and his wife Drusilla might hear him, concerning the faith in Christ, Paul reasoned of righteousness, or justice, and temperance the duties we owe to others, and to ourselves, and of the judgment to come, until he made Felix to tremble, whereby it appears, that temperance and justice were fundamental parts of the religion that Paul professed, and were contained in the faith which he preached, and if we find the duties of the moral law not pressed by him everywhere, we must remember, that most of his sermons left upon record, were preached in their synagogues to the Jews, who acknowledged their obedience due to all the precepts of the law, and would have taken it amiss to have been suspected not to have been more zealous for the law than he, and therefore it was with reason that his discourses were directed chiefly to what they yet wanted, and were averse to, the knowledge and embracing of Jesus, their promised Messiah, but what his preaching generally was, if we will believe him himself, we may see, Acts 26 where giving an account to King Agrippa, of his life and doctrine, he tells him, verse 20, I showed unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. Thus we see, by the preaching of our Saviour and his Apostles, that he required of those who believed him to be the Messiah and received him for their Lord and Deliverer, that they should live by his laws, and that, though in consideration of their becoming his subjects, by faith in him, whereby they believed and took him to be the Messiah, their former sins should be forgiven, yet, he would own none to be his, nor receive them as true denizens of the new Jerusalem, into the inheritance of eternal life, but leave them to the condemnation of the unrighteous who renounced not their former miscarriages, and lived in a sincere obedience to his commands. What he expects from his followers, he has sufficiently declared as a legislator, and that they may not be deceived, by mistaking the doctrine of faith, grace, free, grace, and the pardon and forgiveness of sins, and salvation by him, which was the great end of his coming, he more than once declares to them for what omissions and the miscarriages he shall judge and condemn to death, even those who have owned him, and done miracles in his name, when he comes at last to render to every one according to what he had done in the flesh, sitting upon his great and glorious tribunal, at the end of the world. The first place where we find our Saviour to have mentioned the day of judgment, 
is John 5, 28, 29, in these words, The hour is coming, in which all that are in their grave shall hear his, 1. e. the Son of God's, voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. That which puts the distinction, if we will believe our Saviour, is the having done good or evil, and he gives a reason of the necessity of his judging or condemning those who have done evil, in the following words, verse 30, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of my Father who hath sent me. He could not judge of himself, he had but a delegated power of judging from the Father, whose will he obeyed in it, and who was of purer eyes than to admit any unjust person into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7. 22, 23, speaking again of that day, he tells what his sentence will be, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Faith in the penitent and sincerely obedient, supplies the defect of their performances and so by grace they are made just, but we may observe, none are sentenced or punished for unbelief, but only for their misdeeds, they are workers of iniquity on whom the sentence is pronounced, Matthew 13. 41, at the end of the world, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all scandals, and them which do iniquity, and cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And again, verse 49, the angels shall sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. Matthew 16, 24, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Luke 13, 26, then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drank in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Matthew 25. 31-46 When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left, then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come. Ye blessed with my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was anhungered, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink, I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me, I was sick, and ye visited me, I was in prison, and ye came unto me, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee anhungered? and fed thee, and one hundred, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was anhungered, and ye gave me no meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not, insomuch that ye did it not to one of these, ye did it not to me, and these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. These, I think, are all the places where our Saviour mentions the last judgment, or describes his way of proceeding in that great day wherein, as we have observed, it is remarkable, that everywhere the sentence follows doing or not doing, without any mention of believing or not believing, not that any, to whom the gospel hath been preached, shall be saved, without believing Jesus to be the Messiah, for all being sinners, and transgressors of the law, and so unjust, are all liable to condemnation, unless they believe and so through grace are justified by God, for this faith, which shall be accounted to them for righteousness, but the rest wanting this cover, this allowance for their transgressions, must answer for all their actions, 
and being found transgressors of the law, shall, by the letter and sanction of that law, be condemned for not having paid a full obedience to that law, and not for want of faith. That is not the guilt on which the punishment is laid, though it be the want of faith, which lays open their guilt uncovered, and exposes them to the sentence of the law, against all that are unrighteous. The common objection here, is, if all sinners shall be condemned, but such as have a gracious allowance made them, and so are justified by God, for believing Jesus to be the Messiah, and so taking him for their king whom they are resolved to abate to the utmost of their power, what shall become of all mankind, who lived before our Saviour's time, who never heard of his name, and consequently could not believe in him. To this the answer is so obvious and natural, that one would wonder how any reasonable man should think it worth the urging. No, body was, or can be required to believe, what was never proposed to him to believe. Before the fullness of time, which God from the counsel of his own wisdom had appointed to send his son in, he had, at several times, and in different manners, promised to the people of Israel, an extraordinary person to come, who, raised from amongst themselves, should be their ruler and deliverer. The time, and other circumstances of his birth, life, and person, he had in sundry prophecies so particularly described, and so plainly foretold, that he was well known, and expected by the Jews, under the name of the Messiah, or anointed, given him in some of these prophecies. All then that was required, before his appearing in the world, was to believe what God had revealed, and to rely with a full assurance on God, for the performance of his promise, and to believe, that in due time he would send them the Messiah, this anointed King, this promised Saviour and Deliverer according to his word. This faith in the promises of God, this relying and acquiescing in his word and faithfulness, the Almighty takes well at our hands, as a great mark of homage, paid by us poor frail creatures, to his goodness and truth, as well as to his power and wisdom, and accepts it as an acknowledgement of his peculiar providence, and benignity to us. And therefore our Saviour tells us, John 12, 44, He that believes on me, believes not on me, but on him that sent me. The works of nature show his wisdom and power, but it is his peculiar care of mankind most eminently discovered in his promises to them, that shows his bounty and goodness, and consequently engages their hearts in love and affection to him. This oblation of an heart, fixed with dependence on, and affection to him, is the most acceptable tribute we can pay him, the foundation of true devotion, and life of all religion. What a value he puts on this depending on his word, and resting satisfied in his promises, we have an example in Abraham, whose faith was counted to him for righteousness, as we have before remarked out of Romans 4. And his relying firmly on the promise of God, without any doubt of its performance, gave him the name of the father of the faithful, and gained him so much favor with the Almighty, that he was called the friend of God, the highest and the most glorious title that can be bestowed on a creature. The thing promised was no more but a son by his wife Sarah, and a numerous posterity by him, which should possess the land of Canaan. These were but temporal blessings, and, except the birth of a son, very remote, such as he should never live to see, nor in his own person have the benefit of, but because he questioned not the performance of it, but rested fully satisfied in the goodness, truth, and faithfulness of God, who had promised, it was counted to him for righteousness. Let us see how St. Paul expresses it, Romans 4. 18-22, who, against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was above an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded, 
that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Saint Paul having here emphatically described the strength and firmness of Abraham's faith, informs us, that he thereby gave glory to God, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is the way that God deals with poor frail mortals. He is graciously pleased to take it well of them, and give it the place of righteousness, and a kind of merit in his sight, if they believe his promises, and have a steadfast relying on his veracity and goodness. Saint Paul, Hebrews 11, 6, tells us, without faith it is impossible to please God, but at the same time tells us what faith that is. For, says he, he that cometh to God, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He must be persuaded of God's mercy and goodwill to those who seek to obey him, and rest assured of his rewarding those who rely on him, for whatever, either by the light of nature, or particular promises, he has revealed to them of his tender mercies, and taught them to expect from his bounty. This description of faith, that we might not mistake what he means by that faith, without which we cannot please God, and which recommended the saints of old, St. Paul places in the middle of the list of those who are eminent for their faith, and whom he sets as patterns to the converted Hebrews, under persecution, to encourage them to persist in their confidence of deliverance by the coming of Jesus Christ, and in their belief of the promises they now had under the gospel. By those examples he exhorts them not to draw back from the hope that was set before them, nor apostatize from the profession of the Christian religion. This is plain from verse 35 to 38, of the precedent chapter, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have great need of persisting or perseverance, for so the Greek word signifies here which our translation renders patience. Vide Luke 8. 15, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The examples of faith, which St. Paul enumerates and proposes in the following words, chapter 11 plainly show, that the faith whereby those believers of old pleased God, was nothing but a steadfast reliance on the goodness and faithfulness of God, for those good things, which either the light of nature, or particular promises, had given them grounds to hope for. Of what avail this faith was with God, we may see, verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Verse 7, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, being wary, by faith prepared an ark, to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And what it was that God so graciously accepted and rewarded, we are told, verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child, when she was past age. How she came to obtain this grace from God, the apostle tells us, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Those therefore, who pleased God, and were accepted by him before the coming of Christ, did it only by believing the promises, and relying on the goodness of God, as far as he had revealed it to them. For the Apostle, in the following words, tells us, verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received, the accomplishment of, the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them. This was all that was required of them, to be persuaded of, and embrace the promises which they had. They could be persuaded of no more than was proposed to them, embrace no more than was revealed, according to the promises they had received, and the dispensations they were under, and if the faith of things seen afar off, 
if they're trusting in God for the promises he then gave them, if a belief of the Messiah to come, was sufficient to render those who lived in the ages before Christ acceptable to God, and righteous before him, I desire those who tell us, that God will not, nay, some go so far as to say, cannot, accept any, who do not believe every article of their particular creeds and systems, to consider, why God, out of his infinite mercy, cannot as well justify men now, for believing Jesus of Nazareth to be the promised Messiah, the King and Deliverer, as those heretofore, who believed only that God would, according to his promise, in due time, send the Messiah, to be a King and Deliverer. There is another difficulty often to be met with, which seems to have something of more weight in it, and that is, that through the faith of those before Christ, believing that God would send the Messiah, to be a prince and a saviour to his people, as he had promised, and the faith of those since his time, believing Jesus to be that Messiah, promised and sent by God, shall be accounted to them for righteousness, yet what shall become of all the rest of mankind, who, having never heard of the promise or news of a saviour, not a word of a Messiah to be sent, or that was come, have had no thought or belief concerning him, have had no thought or belief concerning him, have had no